Welcome to Going Beyond the Fan, the Future of Power Supply Thermal Management. Today's webinar is presented by Kai Lee of Meanwell and Paul Kopp and Rich Arietta of Sager Power Systems, a specialized group of Sager Electronics focused solely on power, battery, and thermal electronic components. My name is Mary Ellen Stack of Sager Electronics, and I will be today's moderator. All attendees will be placed on mute. Questions may be asked throughout today's webinar via the Q&A widget window located in your audience console. The Q&A window should be open, but if it is not, there is a Q&A icon at the bottom of the console. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Today's first presenter is Paul Kopp, Sager's Director of Supplier Marketing and Product Management for Power. Thank you, Mary Ellen. And thanks to everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Before we get to our featured speaker, I want to take a few minutes to give you a quick overview of Meanwell and Sager Electronics. Meanwell is a power supply manufacturer ranked number one in global sales for off-the-shelf power supplies. Meanwell is also a leader in NPI. Meanwell grows its portfolio by as much as 10% each year through new product introduction. The Meanwell engineering team is developing high-power, digitally controlled power supplies that are convection, conduction, and water-cooled, which Kai will discuss during his presentation. Meanwell has an excellent breadth of products with over 10,000 standard part numbers in their portfolio, covering from 0.5 watts up to 25,000 watts. Their product mix includes a comprehensive assortment of AC to DC and DC to DC converters, including DIN rail, battery charger, DC to AC inverters, board level power supplies, external adapters, and they are a market leader in enclosed power supplies and LED drivers. Meanwhile has the power conversion products that serve end markets that are essential to the people watching this webinar. Industrial, medical, lighting, horticulture, telecom, and building automation. Meanwhile has a global footprint with diversified manufacturing locations in Taiwan, China, and the Philippines. A key driver for Meanwhile building their factory in the Philippines was to support the North America market and to help customers avoid Section 301 tariff charges. Meanwhile has customer and engineering support in Fremont, California. They have a great team that supports distribution and direct customers. Meanwhile is the fastest growing power supply manufacturer in the world because of its commitment to engineering, quality, and support while also being a price leader. Sager Electronics is a leading distributor of Meanwell in North America. Sager has the number one inventory position with over $7 million centrally located in our warehouse in Carrollton, Texas. We are also stocking all of the Meanwell NPIs and the products that Kai will discuss during his presentation today. The Sager team can assist you with engineering support, samples, and best-in-class distribution services. Here is some additional information on Sager Electronics. Sager Electronics has been in operation for 133 years. The company was acquired by TTI in 2012. This acquisition was great for the Sager team because it allowed the company to make some key acquisitions of our own and build a specialized group that I'll discuss in the next slides. Our corporate headquarters are in Middleborough, Massachusetts, and we have 10 sales locations in the major markets in North America. We've expanded our capabilities by adding value-add solution centers for power, thermal, and battery in Carrollton, Texas, and Lyle, Illinois, that Rich Arietta will discuss during his portion of the presentation. Sager Electronics is an IP&E distributor, but in our case, IP&E stands for Interconnect Power in Electromechanical. We are specializing in power conversion, battery, and thermal products to support customers with complex design challenges. We will continue to invest in and grow this segment of our business. To highlight the specialization, Sager Electronics launched a sub-brand, Sager Power Systems, in February 2015. In this group, we have a team of highly trained, technically experienced professionals working directly with our customers, 
offering a line card of leading power, battery, and thermal manufacturers, along with value-added capabilities. The team has 16 power system sales engineers and business development reps throughout North America, along with six value-add program managers and emerging account specialists. The Sager team is proud of our relationship with MeanWell and would like to support you with your next MeanWell or power systems requirement. I'll now hand it off to our featured presenter, Kai Lee, Product Manager for MeanWell USA. Thank you, Paul. So let's start our topic by introducing the idea that the power supply is a heat source. This concept applies to all types of power supplies and power conversion processes. In a typical power conversion scenario, we can expect less power at the output than at the input. A percentage of converted power is inevitably dissipated as heat thanks to the laws of physics. If we get 90 watts output power when we have 100 watts input, we have a power conversion system with 90% efficiency. 10 watts is lost in the process and dissipated as heat. Now imagine having a higher power system that converts 10,000 watts power and 90% efficiency. We will get 9,000 watts output power. In this case, we have 1,000 watts power dissipated as heat. This is a lot of heat coming out of the power supply, and it is almost as much heat as a typical electric oven. Also, to understand why thermal management is important, we want to examine the expected maximum output current trend in power supply designs. This data is taken from the 2019 PSMA Power Technology Roadmap. We can see that the expected maximum output current is increasing for all power supply sizes examined in this study. We can also see that in approximately three years time frame, an eighth brick size power converter can replace a three year old quarter brick and provide the same or even higher output current level. Same thing can happen to 16th brick replacing 8th brick in output capability. A key driver for this development trend is the miniaturization trend for electronics designs. As power demands increase, we have more heat that we need to remove. Remember the 10,000 watts power supply example earlier? We need to manage 1,000 watts of heat dissipation, and that's a lot of power. On top of that, the power supply sizes are also decreasing. It becomes more difficult to remove heat as the size of devices shrink, for reasons that we examine in the following slides. These two factors combined, the power supply and the internal component temperature will be higher. As a general rule of power electronics reliability, the failure rate doubles for every 10 degrees Celsius rising temperature. So it is crucial to have efficient and effective thermal management to remove heat and allow components to operate in a healthy temperature range. Before we talk about the different thermal management methods and common practices for power supplies, let's take a couple minutes to refresh on the fundamentals of heat transfer. Heat transfer is defined as a movement of thermal energy from one substance or material to another due to a temperature difference. So if we look at this model of two materials joined together, material number one is hot material and material number two is a cold material. Since there is a temperature difference, thermal energy will move from material number one to material number two, and this is heat transferring action. Thermal management for power supplies is managing how to transfer thermal energy away from the power dissipating components and into the cooling medium or environment. There are three means of heat transfer. Conduction means transfer of heat via direct contact of particles of matters. An example of this is an electric stove transferring heat to the frying pan, heating up the frying pan in the process. Convection heat transfer describes a heat transfer between a surface and the liquid or gas that is in motion. An example would be the frying pan cooling down after you removed it from the electric stove. Heat is transferred into the air from the frying pan surface. The third heat transfer method is radiation which occurs when microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, or other electromagnetic radiation is emitted or is absorbed. A good example of this is the microwave oven. Radiation heat transfer is typically ignored in power electronic thermal management. In parentheses is the special case of heat transfer, known as phase change, which involves the transitions between solid, liquid, and gas. We will also ignore this special case for power electronic thermal management. As mentioned previously, 
The two main components of thermal management for power electronics are conduction and convection heat transfers. The example from earlier is conduction heat transfer. For conduction heat transfer, the heat flow Q equals negative K times A times delta T over X. A is the surface area of the two materials that are contacting each other. Normally, thermal interface material is added to maximize the conduction surface area since we cannot guarantee that the surfaces are perfectly smooth. Delta T is the temperature difference between the hotter material and the cooler material. X is the material thickness. And finally, K is the thermal conductivity. The thermal conductivity is the property of the material itself. For convection heat transfer, the heat flow Q equals H times A times delta T. H is the heat transfer coefficient which depends on type of media and flow properties, such as velocity, viscosity, and other flow and temperature dependent properties. It is a coefficient of a process rather than the coefficient of a material. A is the surface area that interfaces with the liquid or gas, and delta T is the difference between the temperature of the surface and the liquid or gas. What these equations mean is that the higher the heat flow Q value, the more effective the thermal management process. If we need to remove more heat from power supplies, we will need to design around the parameters to achieve a higher Q value. Remember we said earlier that as electronics devices size shrink, it becomes more difficult to remove heat. That's because the conducting surface and the surface area of electronic devices are smaller as sizes shrink. This will result in a lower heat flow Q. So we've gotten the fundamentals out of the way. We will first look at fan cooling, also known as forced air convection. As the name suggests, fan cooling mostly relies on convection heat transfer to remove heat. This diagram represents a power supply with two built-in fans. As the fan moves air through the power supply, heat of the components will be picked up by the air particles. The air particles will get warmer in the process, so air exiting the power supply will have higher temperature the air initially going into the power supply. The same is true for reverse airflow direction. For power supply designs, the fan airflow direction typically depends on placement of the fan and locations of heat sensitive components. We want to force as much cool air over the heat sensitive component surface as possible, while avoiding placing them near the exit of the airflow where the temperature is the highest. Advantage of fan cooling in general includes relatively easy implementation and cost effectiveness. There are also many challenges to fan cooling, especially as power supply sizes become smaller. Since components are now packed closer to each other, there is higher airflow impedance, and higher airflow is needed to remove heat effectively. With the higher airflow, the noise level will also increase, which is undesirable in many applications such as household appliances, health care, or audio applications. More importantly, fan is typically regarded as a high failure rate component, not to mention that fan is highly restricted by environmental conditions. In order to solve the issues caused by fans, many power supply manufacturers have started exploring fanless cooling designs for power supplies. Fanless design is easily achievable for low power applications that have relatively low power density. Like our 100 watts example earlier, 10 watts power dissipation is easily manageable for most regular size power supplies. We're mostly interested in medium to high power designs that also focus on being compact as a design consideration. There are three types of fanless power supplies. The first is free air convection type, which cools down through the convection heat transfer between the power supply surface and the surrounding air. This type of power supply typically does not require external components and is generally the easiest to use. The second type is conduction cooling type. For this type of power supply, they are mounted on external heat sinks or base plate to help extract heat through conduction heat transfer. So in addition to the power supply, external components are also required to cool them effectively. The third type is water cooling type. Water or other liquid cooling method is used to increase the effectiveness of heat removal. 
But these systems are more complex to work with and require specific installation and external components to function properly. Out of the three, water cooling type is the most effective at removing heat from the power supply. So it is generally used for high power density and higher power applications. Conduction cooling is used for medium to high power applications, while convection type is generally limited to medium power level applications up to 1000 watts. Let's take a closer look at each type of furnace power supplies, starting with free air convection type. Free air convection type is typically the most difficult to achieve high power density since we're not relying on any external systems or components for cooling. A common practice to help the power supply cool down is by fully potting the power supply with silicon gel. What this means is there's no air gap inside the power supply. Silicon gel is better at conducting heat than air is, and they can help spread the heat throughout the power supply more evenly to the metal enclosure of the power supply. By doing this, we're maximizing the utilization of the enclosure surface and increasing the effective cooling area for the convection heat transfer process. Looking at the convection heat transfer equation, we're increasing the surface area A to achieve a higher Q value. To capitalize on this, the metal enclosure is also specially designed with thin surface to further increase the surface area. Advantages of the free air convection power supplies includes elimination of fan, which is what we're trying to achieve with the fanless solutions. At the same time, we're able to provide the environmental protections to the power supply and components since we're potting the power supply. Dust or even water cannot come in contact with the components because they're protected by silicon gel. To use this to our advantage, Meanwell has designed many IP67 or even IP68 dustproof and waterproof power supplies. Another advantage for free air convection power supply is that they do not rely on additional components, so they're easy to design into the end systems. But there are also challenges and disadvantages for free air convection power supply. First of all is weight. Since we're filling the air gap in between all components, the potting compounds add quite some weight to the power supplies. They become impractical to use if they become too big. This is another reason why free air convection power supplies are limited to medium power applications in addition to the heat removal effectiveness. Another challenge is cost. Since the heat removal effectiveness is lower in comparison to other types of fanless and fan cool designs, we have to use higher grade components that provide higher efficiency. So a big challenge in designing practical free air convection type power supply is also considering the cost effectiveness of the various components and the potting compound is not cheap either. Next, let's take a look at conduction cooling type power supplies. The diagram here shows a conduction cooling power supply already mounted onto an external base plate or heat sink, which typically is not provided with the power supply. Since the power supply generates heat when it operates, the temperature of the power supply is higher than the metal base plate. Heat is transferred to the base plate through conduction heat transfer, then the heat is removed from the system through air convection. The base plate or heat sink serves the purpose of expanding the effective cooling surface area. Unlike free air convection design, which distributes heat evenly to the power supply enclosure, conduction cooling type power supply concentrates heat towards the heat sink. The high temperature components are typically directly mounted near the heat sink side, and this provides an effective pass to remove heat through conduction heat transfer. The advantage of the conduction cooling type also includes the elimination of fan from the system, and the power supply cost can be lower since we've subtracted the cost for fan and silicon gel compound. The higher heat transfer efficiency also means we don't need to rely on peak efficiency components. And the most important advantage is that heat removal can be directed. In free air convection, Heat is released into the surrounding environment. When they're mounted inside the system enclosure, heat is released inside the system, which may affect other components in the system. In conduction cool design, heat is mainly removed from the heat sink. In cases where the system enclosure is metal, the enclosure may be sufficient as a heat sink. Overall, heat is more easily directed outside of the system. And the biggest challenge for using conduction cool power supply is that it requires a heat sink or base plate, 
which is a small inconvenience for the big advantage it brings to the system design. Lastly, let's look at the water cooling type power supplies. The water cooling type can be considered as a type of conduction cooling power supply because heat is still primarily extracted from the power supply via conduction heat transfer. The difference here is that after heat is removed from the power supply, heat is removed from the system via water convection instead of air convection. Water cooling is generally used for high power density and high power applications, where extra heat transfer capability is required. There are two different approaches for water cooling power supply design. The first approach is incorporating a water-cooled heat sink. The water-cooled heat sink is used to increase the rate at which heat is removed from the system. If we review the convection heat transfer formula, remember that the heat transfer coefficient, H, depends on various factors, such as velocity and viscosity of the surrounding fluid or air. By using water cooling, we're increasing the heat transfer coefficient because water gives us a higher heat transfer coefficient than air. We're resorting back to forced convection, like in fan cooling, but instead of air, we're using water. As mentioned previously, water cooling relies on external chiller and equipment, so it is much more costly to in integrate into the systems. As a result, water cooling power supply is generally only worthwhile on high power applications or applications that require extremely high power density. Now, let's look at the heat transfer dynamics for our approach number one. The heat still transfers from the power supply to the water cool heat sink via conduction heat transfer. Then cold water will be pumped into the heat sink. Heat on the heat sink will be transferred to the water as water travels through the heat sink. Then water exiting the heat sink will be warm because it pick up the heat on the heat sink. Warm water will then travel to the external water chiller. The water chiller will cool the water back down and pump back uh, cool, cooled water into the heat sink, repeating the process. The water chiller does release heat into the surrounding, but it is also possible to put the chiller remotely. The water chiller may have pumps and fans that generate noise, but the acoustic noise level is generally lower than a forced air-cooled power supply running at maximum capacity. Now, let's move on to approach number two of water cooling type power supply, which is water-cooled components instead of water-cooled base plate. In this approach, components are cooled individually or in smaller groups instead of being cooled by a single heat sink from, for the entire power supply. This approach requires special packaging of components and more complex routing of the cooling pipes since they will now be internal to the power supply. The heat sinks are now internal to the power supply and the conduction heat transfer from each component is more precisely controlled. The advantage for such approach is to maximize the effectiveness of removing heat, while it's minimizing the amount of heat that is released into the surrounding. In the previous approaches and cooling types, regardless of the main heat removal method, some amount of heat is still released into the component surrounding environment uh, via air convection, and some high heat components may be affecting more heat sensitive components that do not generate much heat. In this approach, we can target the specific components and minimize its effect on the environment. The cost for this design is, of course, complexity. So this type of design is typically only utilized in high-precision high instruments. The cost is much higher due to specialized packaging and heat sink designs for individual components. And the overall size of the power supply is also impacted due to the internal heat sink and piping network. To emphasize why water cooling is desirable or required in some applications, let's take a look at water cooling in comparison to fan cooling when they're installed inside of end systems. For water cooling, the heat from the power supply is transferred to the cooling plate and then carried out of the system by water. Since very little heat is released to the power supply surrounding environment, there's no need to leave space for air circulation and ventilation. On the contrary, for fan cooling, Sufficient space is required for the fan to move air effectively. If the power supply is tightly enclosed, the fan will circulate hot air in the system. As a result, the heat from the power supply will affect other components as well. Ventilation holes and mesh enclosure may be used to help with the heat removal from the system. But this also makes the system more vulnerable to dust and water, 
and makes harsh environment operation more difficult. So to help determine which type of power supply is the most suitable for your application, we will compare them in seven different categories. In terms of acoustic noise, free air convection and conduction cooling type wins out since their fan is completely eliminated. For water cooling, there may still be acoustic noise caused by the external chiller. In terms of component reliability, water cooling generally provides the best performance due to its effectiveness at removing heat and keeping the components cool. The lower the temperature, the lower the failure rate. For environmental protection capability, free air convection, conduction, and water cooling types are all comparable, but free air convection edges out slightly due to the fully potted design potentials. For power supply unit cost, forced air convection, also known as fan cooled, is generally the lowest. For the next two categories, water cooling has the highest potential power level potential, and conduction cooling type has the best potential for keeping system size small. And lastly, forced air convection and free air convection types are easiest to design with, so they're the most common types as well. Couple of examples looking at this chart. If you want to design a very compact system for a noiseless application, you'd probably want to choose a conduction cool type power supplies. And if you have an application that doesn't really care about noise, but is very high power level, you may have to go with a water-cooled power supply. Now, I want to take a couple of minutes to highlight some fanless power solutions from Minwell. First, we have the conduction-cooled UHP series, which comes in various models, ranging from 200 to 2,500 watts output power. The UHP series is a conduction cooled type power supply that requires mounting on external base plates. The series is semi-potted on the bottom half to help with conducting and spreading heat out more evenly to the base plate. The semi-potting covers the PCB and SMD components, so it also provides some degree of protections against dust and moisture. For the UHP series, we offer PM bus and CAN bus options for high power models that are 1500 watts or above. Some suitable applications are industrial control systems, signage, displays, and industrial machinery like CNC machines. In the middle, we have our HEP series, which is designed specifically for harsh environment applications. This series comes in 100 to 1000 watts models, and it is designed for free air convection operation, so no external components are required. It is fully potted and sealed to achieve up to IP68 ingress protection level. The 1001 model comes with built-in PM bus, with CAN bus also available as an option. Suitable applications for the HEP series include telecommunication equipment and other types of outdoor equipment. It is even suitable for use outdoor in extremely cold climates, since some models are specifically designed for cold start at negative 55 degrees Celsius. On the right side, we have the PHP series, which is our 3500 watts conduction cool type power supply with water cooling plate. The unit is conformal coated and comes with built-in PM bus with optional CAN bus protocol. The PHP 3500 supports many different cooling methods that give different level of access to the 3500 watts maximum rate of output power. Suitable applications for the PHP series include laser equipment, UV curing, semiconductor fabrication equipment, and more. Next, let's take a look at a water cooling configuration with the PHP 3500 series as an example. This is approach number one for water cooling power supply. So we pair the power supply with a water cooling plate. The water cooling plate is designed specifically for the PHP 3500 to ensure the best heat transfer performance. Once mounted with thermal interface material added in between, we can hook up the power supply to the chiller. On the right side is what you'd expect in a water-cooled setup. Since the PHP 3500 series support different cooling methods, let's look at the PHP 3500 as a case study for comparing the effectiveness of different cooling methods. Shown on the left side is the output power versus temperature curve for operating under free air convection meaning no external cooling and just a power supply by itself. The PHP 3500 can output 50% load at up to 25 degrees Celsius, which is point A on the curve. 
and can operate at temperature up to 50 degrees Celsius, but with low derated to 20%, which is point B on the curve. For the cooling effectiveness, we're measuring a specific case temperature hotspot on the enclosure. After 30 minutes of operating at 50% load at room temperature, the case temperature rose to 41.3 degrees Celsius, which is a 15.7 degrees Celsius temperature rise. Now, let's look at the conduction cooling performance. A cooling plate has been added to the bottom of the PHP 3500. The power supply can now output more power at higher temperature. Point A has increased from 50% at 25 degrees Celsius to 65% at 40 degrees Celsius. Point B has been increased from 20% at 50 degrees to 20% at 65 degrees Celsius. If we operate this setup with the same output power as before, after 30 minutes, the same case temperature increases to 35.3 degrees Celsius, which is only 9.6 degrees of temperature rise. Now, to access the full power output, we're looking at the water cooling performance curve. In comparison to the free air convection cooling curve, point A increases to 100% output power at 50 degrees Celsius, and point B increases to 50% at 70 degrees Celsius. After operating at room temperature for 30 minutes under the same low conditions as tested before, the same case temperature rises to 27.1 degrees Celsius, which is only 1.5 degrees temperature rise. This is a huge difference in comparison to the 15 degrees Celsius rise in free air convection operation. Remember that failure rate doubles for every 10 degrees Celsius rise in temperature. In our specific case, the failure rate with free air convection is more than twice the failure rate with water cooling. Our example demonstrates that appropriate thermal management is very important for power electronics, especially with the trends of increasing power and decreasing size. We need to maximize the effectiveness of different heat transfers to keep the temperature down. In today's session, we compared fan cooling which mainly relies on forced air convection to extract heat from the power supply and explored three types of fanless power supplies, which are free air convection type, conduction cooling type, and water cooling type power supplies. They have different level of heat extraction capability, but it is not practical to just use water cooling for all applications. Each type has its merit and disadvantages and is suitable for specific types of applications. So as power supply manufacturers, our job is to maximize the power supply performance by optimizing the thermal management design. With more effective heat exchange and heat transfer designs, we'll be able to elongate the power supply lifetime and also design higher power products to enable higher power applications. Thank you. Next, I'll hand it over to Mr. Rich Ariata, who is the Director of Business Development for Engineering Solutions team at Sager Electronics. He will talk about the Sigri Electronics Value as Services and share with you guys some case studies that relate to thermal management for power supplies. Thanks, Kai. Great to be here with you guys. As we mentioned earlier in the presentation, we have a 20,000 square foot facility, which we call the PSC, or Power Solution Center, located in Carrollton, Texas, and houses our team of mechanical and electrical designers, test engineers, and assemblers. Sager also inventories our power products at this location, which is valued over $24 million today. The products that we design and produce here range from simple assemblies, which we would include such things as a custom, a custom bracket to mount a power supply or fan, a connectorization of a power supply or fan, to more complex assemblies such as box builds, power boards, and fan trays, which in most cases would include custom board designs and custom sheet metal enclosures. The Power Solution Center is also a UL approved facility for the assembly and testing of our suppliers' modular power products, including those provided by Meanwell. We emphasize quick turnaround on quotes and production of modular power supplies within 48 hours for smaller quantities and larger quantities of, say, 10 within five days if required. Our overall goal within the PSC is really to integrate standard power and thermal products from our manufacturers into a customer-specific design, which allows the end solution to be, in most cases, lower cost, while providing a quicker path to market 
for our customers. Even though our presentation today highlighted active cooling and fanless designs, our customers often still have a requirement for cooling solutions using standard air movers, heat sinks, and thermal interface materials. Sega Power Systems has four of the top global fan manufacturers in EBM, NMB, Sanyo Danke, and Sunon, along with leading suppliers of heat sinks, thermal materials from Boyd, Avid, Wakefield Vet, ATS, Laird, and Berquist. And before I turn the presentation back to the team, I wanted to share a couple of examples of solutions that we are providing to our customers today within our Power Solution Center. The first example you see here highlights a box build design. In this design, we needed to match a footprint and design envelope left behind from a discontinued product. This design required custom sheet metal, of course, and printed circuit boards to mount the integration of five Meanwhile EPP series of open frame power supplies. We also included a low-speed Sanyo Denki fan to manage the cooling. We are awaiting agency approval, which was required of this design as well. The second example here demonstrates a box build design again, but this time using a conduction cooled UHP series by Meanwell that Kai highlighted earlier in the presentation. Due to the envelope restrictions within this application, however, we needed to introduce a low speed fan along with custom heat sinks, interface material, and base plates to assist in the heat dissipation of the design. Okay. So I thank you all for allowing me time to present to you today, and I will now turn it over to Mary Ellen Stack for our Q&A session. Thank you, Rich. If anyone has any questions, please enter them into the Q&A window now. Thank you, Rich. Um, let's see. We are... Uh getting quite a number of questions that are coming in. Hi, let's start with this first one. For the water-cooled Meanwell power supply, can it work with custom water cooling plate or sink, and must they use the Meanwell version? Uh, yeah, hi, thank you, Mary Allen. Um, so, so for this uh, question, um, uh, Meanwell, of course, we provide a um, standard cooling plate with our PHP 3500 series. This is to help with the design process and to integrate the water cooling solution as fast as possible. But of course, if the customer system already has uh, a cooling plate where they have the capability to design a cooling plate around the PHP 3500, uh, of course, they can use that. And meanwhile, we are uh, going to help you to provide the, uh, the thermal data and the assistance uh, during the whole design process. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question, what is the max power coolable and free air convection PSU? Uh, so, uh, so this is a, a very, uh, I think it's a, a great question and uh, um, it, it really depends on the power conversion efficiency and the size. So uh, the 1000 watt product right now that we, we just launched earlier uh, this year, uh, that's at, uh, that's very a very high power density product already. So when we're talking about the maximum power, also considering the power density uh, as well as the power conversion efficiency. So uh, I think in the future, this power we can see the the maximum power to continue to go up. But uh, keep, do keep in mind a point is that we have to uh, manage the practical weight and the the uh, the power dis dissipation of the size. So uh, I think uh, uh, we, we believe that around 1,000 watts the speed bar right now, but of course in some uh, more specialized applications, uh, we can definitely have the capability to design the power uh, to a higher level, yeah. Okay, um, let's see, for the PHP, by what means do you transfer the heat to the bottom of the PSU surface to the cold plate? Yeah, um, so uh, so this was a, a key design consideration uh, for the PHP during our uh, design, uh, during our R&D. So the, uh, the power dissipating and the high, high heat components, they are uh, directly mounted and bolted to the, to the bottom plate of the PHP itself. And so that will enable the maximum uh, heat, direct heat, uh, conduction heat transfer from the components to the, um, to the heat sink that's mounted directly below. So, uh, so that is uh, through con conduction 
uh, conduction heat transfer to extract that heat into the uh, into the cold plate. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. What series is rated for minus fifty five degrees Celsius cold start? Okay. Um, so um, so this the series is the HEP series. So that's the one that's designed for the harsh environment operations. Um, the HEP series, uh, and it, the, uh, there's a slight difference as well between the different power levels, but uh, products below uh, 480 watts, they can all uh, post start at negative 55 degrees Celsius. And uh, for our 600 watts and 1000 watts uh, models in the HEP family, they can post start at negative 40 degrees Celsius. So, um, so yeah, so it's the medium to low power models of the HEP product family. Okay. Are there potting mediums for different temperature ranges, or is there one for all applications? Uh, for the uh, for the power supply, uh, typical operating uh, temperature range, uh, a single um, uh, potting medium uh, is typically uh, sufficient. We don't have uh, different uh, potting mediums, and of course, this also depends on uh, if there's more specialized application that's geared towards higher temperature then it may perform better. And uh, we also have to consider the potting medium's um, thermal expansion uh, coefficient, right? But uh, for our purpose and for the general power, power electronics applications, so power supply applications, uh, a single potting medium is, uh, is sufficient. All right. Uh, can a single custom cooling plate, could that be used to cool down when units are connected in parallel to achieve higher power from an array of power supplies? Uh, yes, this is uh, definitely achievable. And uh, in addition to uh, other power supplies, uh, the the same cooling plate, the same uh, same stream of water cooling can also be uh, used to cool other components as well. But uh, what we specify, of course, uh, is the, the water flow and also the water temperature. So we just have to we just have to make sure the, uh, the water temperature is uh, cold enough. So that depends on the chiller capacity as well. And uh, uh, also the air, the water flow, the water flow speed is also a very a very key component in uh, designing the sufficient um, cooling. Uh, but the power supplies, we do specify a way to make sure that the power supply is sufficiently cooled. So uh, uh, the the system designer can monitor a single case temperature on the power supply to make sure the internal components they are uh, cool cool enough and are receiving sufficient cooling. Okay. Um, let's see, next question. Since phase change cooling has higher cooling capacity than water cooling, do you see phase change cooling taking off for power electronics? And as a follow-up to that, what would be the additional design considerations around phase change cooling compared to the water cooling technique? Uh, so, so right now, I think there are a lot of research that's being done uh, on the phase, ch uh, phase change cooling uh, for uh, power electronics and of course other uh, other uh, fields as well, uh, I think this may may eventually be uh, be the next thing after liquid cooling, water cooling uh, for power supplies uh, that we start to see more implementations into. But for now, I think the um, the, the cost and the, also the uh, component packaging and all the uh, different uh, parameters that come into play with the phase change uh, cooling method. Uh, it's not uh, uh, realized or not as uh, mature yet. So we may see that in the future, but right now we, we do not see uh, much trend in the, uh, in the market in the industry. All right. Um, let's see, next question. What are the thermal conductivity requirements for the potting materials? Uh, so the, um, the, uh, the thermal conductivity is uh, uh, relatively lower in comparison to uh, to the metal, of course. But um, uh, typical silicon, uh, there are, are a number of uh, potting specifically designed for conducting heat, and uh, uh, the main uh, main main purpose for this is to fill the air gaps and to, uh, of course, they conduct uh, uh, heat better than air, and uh, also to spread out heat more evenly. So um, it's really, uh, there is definitely a requirement, but that depends on the specific design as well. And if it's, uh, if we see that a design is not, like a power supply that we designed, a specific potting material is not performing to the specs or not performing as we like, 
we may move to a higher or sometimes even lower semiconductivity um, uh, packing material. Yeah. Okay. Um, what makes the free air convection cost high? Uh, so this is uh, relative to the specific um, product, of course, and uh, 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 I think a, a few factors is that uh, a few factors is that uh, the uh, the size size of the power supply. So for air convection, uh, typically uh, to get rid of the heat, uh, effectively you have to be um, uh, higher, right? The size needs to be bigger. So material cost is a factor, and also for free air convection designs, we really need to use those um, peak efficiency. Um, uh, um, components for power switching to design the uh, the power conversion efficiency as possible as, uh, as we can. So um, the cost in the components themselves also uh, is a, uh, is a uh, cost increase. So that's why a lot of the higher power uh, free air convection products on the market, uh, the costs are uh, much higher than say a fan cooled or a, uh, a conduction cooled. All right. Um, here's a question for Rich. Um, does Sager Power Systems provide test data for power value add assemblies? Uh, that's a good question. So the answer is yes. 100% uh, of our power assemblies are tested dynamically under load with our ATE equipment. And that test data is available, uh, can be shipped within the container within each supply, or the data can also be stored in our system and shared electronically with our customers. Okay, well, let's see. Um, how about this one? Will modifications to a standard power supply or fan void the warranty or impact? Rich, that looks like another one for you. Yeah, yeah. So we get that uh, <laughs> question quite often, and and there is no really one size fits all answer. But you know, for for power supply modifications, as long as we are making adjustments to the DC side of the power supply, for example, a connector change or cable extension to an adapter or a desktop power supply, the majority of our manufacturers would allow Sager to make these modifications with warranty and uh, agencies remaining intact. Uh, as mentioned in the, the presentation earlier, our power systems facility in Texas is a UL approved assembly site for our modular power products. So even with the inherent custom nature of these products with modifications to the output voltages, uh, current limiting, paralleling of outputs, bus bars, et cetera, all of which are performed in-house, these assemblies are shipped to our customers with full agency approvals. Uh, and I think you mentioned fans too. With fan modifications, it would be very similar to that of an adapter or desktop supply, where as long as we're only making simple mechanical changes or modifications to the unit, for example, a connector change, a wire lead length change, or the addition of a custom label in some cases, these modifications would not impact by the warranty nor the agency approvals. Okay. Um, Kai, why is the fully potted design only used for free air convection types? And can, can conduction cooled and water cooled also use fully potted design? Uh, yeah, and we also see uh, fully potted designs for some uh, conduction cooled uh, power supplies and water cooled, but uh, so, uh, in, in uh, some of the designs that we typically see, uh, it's not desirable or not necessary. Uh, so the purpose, as explained during the presentation of the potting, is to spread out heat more evenly and to make as much con uh, conduction heat transfer to the uh, power supply surface and enclosure as possible. So if we fully pot a uh, conduction cooled or uh, a water cooled, you may uh, direct heat to uh, places we don't want them to go. For the conduction, uh, water could definitely want the heat to be uh, directed to the cold plate or the heat sinks as much as possible, right? So it's just not desirable. But uh, for, for some uh, outdoor or specialized applications, uh, we've, we've definitely seen some uh, fully potted uh, utilizations um, as well. Okay. Um, when performing CFD simulation of servers and high computing devices, how do you model power supplies realistically in the whole electronic enclosure? And is there a rule of thumb for incorporating power supplies in server design? Um, for, the, for this question, I think um, 
a key consideration on the rule of thumb uh, for to start the, the modeling uh, is to find out how much power is dissipated from the power supply. And that's a, a, the inquiry we get a lot of the times. So a customer will ask how much power or how much heat. So power, the power loss can be directly uh, trans translated as the, the heat generated, right? So uh, to model that, it would just be, uh, and that depends on the specific uh, cooling High power supply as well. If it's a air uh, air cooled, you would model it slightly differently, and as well as the direction that the heat is being transferred to, uh, versus uh, like a conduction cooled that you can just um, worry about the uh, the heat transfer from the, uh, the conduction cooling plate. But uh, uh, it mostly depends on, on the specific design, uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, for these type of questions and design. Uh, uh, considerations, uh, uh, our customers and you guys feel free to reach out to uh, to the Sager team and to Meanwell. Uh, Meanwhile, we have our local office in California, Fremont, so we have a local uh, engineering team to support uh, our uh, North America customer as well. Okay. Um, do you have cost, size, and weight comparison of free air convection power supplies with existing fan-driven power supplies for the same output power? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, for the, um, for, we don't, uh, it's difficult to do a comparison uh, like this because uh, the cost uh, plays very, uh, uh, also contributes from the uh, the power efficiency, the other various functions, whether it's, it has communication features or uh, advanced controls like that. Um, but for, uh, for a very uh, similar product in, in the meanwhile line, uh, I think we can see that for the same power, uh, power level and sim uh, similar size, um, the cost and weight uh, for the uh, free air convection product is typically about uh, 1.5 times, uh, around 1.5 times on average versus the, uh, the fan-cooled uh, product. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. I think we are running out of time and we are going to wrap up today's conference. Any um, questions that we didn't get to during um, during the Q&A, we will respond to you directly um, in a follow-up correspondence and, and make the presentation available. Uh, thank you again for your time on behalf of both Meanwell and Sager Power Systems. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you.